morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. This show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon metro area. Now, for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is that we decide to talk about. And we will be talking about why social change. Why social change? And there's a lot behind that, but I think we'll get to that as we get to the second half of the show. Because as you know, the first half of the show, half, first half, uh, 30, 25 minutes, uh, we talk about uh, who Dr. Uphoff is, Eugene J. Uphoff, MD, medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And the second half of the show or thereabouts will be uh, the topic of the show, why social change? And a whole bunch of other related uh, questions that is going to show you how interesting Gene is. May I call you Gene? Absolutely. And I'm Don. <clears throat> and how are you feeling right now? Just absolutely fine. You're not nervous? Nope. Why is it I'm always nervous <laughs> and my guests are never <laughs> nervous? <laughs> I don't have to plan the show. <laughs> <laughs> and we've, had, we've sat across <clears throat> from each other before some time ago yes. when you were a guest. And I've seen you in, in other uh, venues and other uh, social gatherings, and we've had mm -hmm. a few words then, but not as intimate as we're going to be tonight. That's fine. I love your tie. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a little flashy, but. Uh, good, good. So uh, let's get right into it then and talk about who you are. And if I were to, if I were to ask your best friend to who is Jean, mm -hmm. what would your best friend say? Jean is what? They uh, would probably describe me as... Be your best friend, speak in, in the first okay. person. My best friend would say he's consistent, he's reliable, and dependable. Hmm. That's a triple threat. Mm -hmm. Of sorts. Yeah, I think I got that from my parents. Uh -huh. I, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin uh, in a small farming community. We had a 140-acre farm. My parents uh, took to the farm mostly to escape World War II. My father was a conscientious objector, and rather than going into the army, he uh, agreed to take over the management of Fellowship Farm. It was a farm that was started as a retreat by the Fellowship of Reconciliation as a way for pacifists and those who wanted to oppose the war to gather and to engage in a spiritual approach to nonviolence. Are you cut from the same cloth as your dad? Pretty much so. My dad actually was probably even a bit more radical than I am. He, uh, he grew up uh, pretty actively involved with the Socialist Party in Wisconsin. He ran for governor twice. He actually ran against uh, Joe McCarthy for the U.S. Senate. Of course, he lost, sad to say. Wow. That might have changed history somewhat. You're a name dropper. I love it. <laughs> my, my mother ran for the Congress, uh, also lost. Uh, none of them actually won elected office. As but as they ran. But socialists in Wisconsin actually had quite a period. Uh, Frank Zeidler was the mayor of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for about 20 years. Uh -huh. And he was one of the active socialists then. So I come by my radicalism pretty naturally. My wife's going to have to watch this show because uh, she's from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oh, really? Yeah. Great. Home of the EAA. <laughs> yes. We've been back three <clears throat> times uh, uh, on that date when they're there, that week. It's a great week. I've been there a couple of times myself. Oh, I have stories about that, too. Yeah. I had a special pass because I knew somebody who was active mm -hmm. and I like, sat in the front row and watched the course hairs flip and all that kind of crazy Amazing. Stuff. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so, and you said you were born in Wisconsin, and whereabouts again? Tell me again. Actually, my hometown is Oregon, Wisconsin. Oh. It's pronounced Oregon back there instead of Oregon. Uh -huh. It's about five miles south of Madison. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Why were you born? Good question. I was the second of four sons. My mother kind of got tired of waiting for a daughter, so she ended up teaching all of us how to bake bread and do laundry and, you know, <laughs> clean up the house. So I guess she figured if she wasn't going to have a daughter, she'd have to teach her sons how to do all that stuff. Do you know how to cook a little bit? Absolutely. What's your favorite dish? My current favorite is paella. I, le I learned how to make that in Spain, and, and uh, I love to make paella. Yeah, I've tasted it a few times. It's 
amazing. See, I'm, I'm drooling as you talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, again, if I ask you a question that you're uncomfortable with or you just don't want to answer, you can say, I don't want to answer that. Sure. And, uh, okay, then, any, any uh, thing significant or unusual about your national or cultural heritage? Um, I would say mostly the uh, difference in my political background because as a kid even, you know, my dad was running for governor when I was going to grade school in Wisconsin and, uh, you know, we got a lot of flack on the school bus going into town just because nobody else in the community was radical, nobody else was socialist, so. But we learned to weather that storm pretty well. Where'd your dad get his uh, leanings from, political leanings? Well, was it none of the family, more than no, one generation? No, actually, it was quite a change. He grew up in a very conservative religious community outside Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, but when he went to college at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, he became acquainted with George Collins. They called him Shorty Collins because he was six foot six or so. But uh, Shorty Collins was actually a radical pap uh, pacifist. Uh, and he was a Baptist student pastor there at the university. And he had a very strong influence on my dad, who then subsequently got involved with some of the Quaker activities. And I think we moved progressively more liberal from there. Any further left, you'll fall off the end? I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> got, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> I'm waiting to see. I'm going to fall off any moment. <laughs> uh, a religious preference, did you ever have one? And do you have one now? Well. I was, I, I say that I was raised as a Quaker. I, I think for a while we attended the Baptist Church in Wisconsin when we moved to Minneapolis when I was in fifth grade. Then we uh, sort of fell in with the Quakers and, and mm -hmm. I really, I think that's been the life uh, guidance that's been most meaningful to me, although more recently I find myself drawn to Buddhist philosophy. Yeah. So, but I, I'm kind of ecumenical. Okay. I have a special sort of a, uh, a thinking or feeling about Buddhism. If I ever take the time to explore some other way of thinking other than being an agnostic or mm -hmm. atheist, I'm a recovering Catholic, as you know, mm -hmm. then I would probably lean more about Buddhist. And if you see a Buddha along the road, you should take his life because there ain't no such thing as a Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. That's all I'm going to say about Buddhism yeah. because you know more than I do. Uh, and we talked a bit about your formal education. Anything unusual or significant about your education process? Well, there was an interesting thing that happened to me. I, got, I, I started college thinking that I would be either a photojournalist or an aeronautical engineer. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, photojournalism because I had liked photography and taken lots of pictures through high school. And, and aeronautical engineering because I built model airplanes when I was a kid. But after two years in college where I had taken everything from economics to music theory to astronomy to sociology, um, I had no idea what I was going to do. So I went to the counseling bureau at the university and I explained my dilemma that I didn't have a major, didn't have enough classes in any one thing to get a major. And they said, well, come on in and take some tests, and we'll see if we can figure it out. So I spent a whole day taking probably a half a dozen different tests, everything from attitude tests, aptitude tests, uh, of course, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality MMPI. Inventory, yeah. MMPI, I had to take that. Um, it came back in three weeks when they were all scored, and they said, have you ever thought about going into medicine? And hey. I said, no. And uh, they said, well, you know, these tests aren't always right, but the composite score from these would suggest that you'd be very happy with the career in medicine. You should talk to somebody about it. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I had spent, I'd had a two credit health class that was required that I really liked. And I thought that was interesting. So I went and talked to the instructor who was the head of the student health service and he was very encouraging. He said, yes. And he said, I can't think of a better way to spend your life. So I said, okay. And that's it. Next two years, I went back and got biology and chemistry and organic chemistry and physics and all of the classes I had been avoiding like the plague for two <laughs> years. Because I wanted to be a photojournalist. Because I wanted to be a photojournalist <laughs> or something. And, uh, and I got accepted to two medical schools and I chose to go to Colorado and uh, loved it. And an odd thing happened, and I, I'll, I'll explain this. I don't know 
for sure if it's real or not. But Please. The morning that I started medical school, 8 o'clock in the morning, we sat in this big auditorium, and there was the dean and the assistant dean and the department heads all came up and gave us their little 10-minute talks about what we were going to do for the next four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was sitting there and listening to everybody come up and talk, I had this sensation that the lights in the auditorium suddenly got turned up about three times as bright. And I looked around and nobody else seemed to notice that. And it lasted maybe a few seconds and then it went back to normal. And I couldn't explain it. I didn't ask anybody about it. It seemed weird. Um, but the feeling I had was that somehow I had ended up where I was supposed to be. And it's the closest I can come to imagining what a uh, religious experience would be like yes. to have this sudden yes. insight, like this is what I'm meant to do with my life. And that never changed. It never wavered. I, all the way through medical school, even when my classmates were grumbling about the neuroanatomy tests and stuff, I thought, this is really cool. This is really great. That's, so, I'm that's so, an unusual story. I am so lucky. I can't imagine what my life would have been like had, had I not had those sequence of things that kind of pointed me in that direction and said, hey, dummy, go do this. <laughs> Have you had any other <laughs> similar experiences Never in your have. life? Never have, no. Smart. I've always enjoyed what I do. Mm -hmm. And how about your brothers? Well, I have an older brother who's a political scientist and has done a lot of work with um, basically agricultural development and rice culture in countries that depend on rice for growing mm -hmm. and has, has been very successful in promoting something called SRI, which is System of Rice Intensification. It's a, it's a way of changing how rice is planted. So instead of planting those little bundles of rice, maybe six or eight plants together and putting them a foot apart, you put one or two grains together planted, but space them closer. And it lets the roots develop better and they grow better and they produce yields that are anywhere from 20 to 60 percent more than using the standard techniques. How did he learn that? Learned it from, it was reading some writings by a, a French monk who had done some research on this and talked about the development of the roots. And my brother, of course, having grown up on a farm like I did, got really interested in this. And, uh, and he's been able to encourage the agricultural departments in countries in Southeast Asia and India and China and Vietnam and so on to adopt uh, trials of this and it's gradually gaining ground and the nice thing is it doesn't take extra fertilizer or extra water to do this it just takes a little more work and no change in water or fertilizer they actually use less water because they don't keep the fields flooded as long okay um, but yeah it's it's been amazing my younger brother Charlie has been very active in political stuff uh, he's currently on the school board back in Oregon Wisconsin my youngest brother, Wally, is now retired. He's a roofer, a former roofer. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, we've all had sort of different directions to go. Where's mom and dad now? Both my parents died. Oh. Yeah, my mother lived to 100, though, so I figure I've got some oh, genetics on my okay. side. Yeah. Okay. So I, I figure I've got some good genetics on my <laughs> side. I've got a few years ahead. How's your health across the board? with your years. It's on just your, fine. You're just a kid. Look at you compared yep. to me. Just fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming up on 74, but that's... You're well... But I'm hanging in there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, you're still practicing. I'm not. Um, my wife died two years ago, or two and a half, uh, breast cancer. Okay. I'm and sorry. when she went into hospice, I thought, you know, this is crazy. I was 71 at the time, and I couldn't think of a reason to keep going into the clinic every day instead of spending time with my kids and grandkids. So I thought, That's not, I'm done. And fortunately, I have enough interests and in other things I've been doing that I haven't been bored in the slightest. What are you doing with these other things now? <clears throat> well, the, the, one of the big ones, of course, is health care reform, uh, which has always been an interest of mine. And, and you may recall we talked on your show, what, six years ago now or seven, gosh, can't even imagine it's that long, about the Mad as Hell Doctor tour that we did. Of course. And uh, so we spent six, well, like four weeks, I guess, all together, um, touring across the country, doing town hall meetings for, 
for uh, hopefully for some effect on the health care debate, but it didn't really have much impact. To the what a name, mad as hell doctors. Mm -hmm. Why did you guys choose that name? Well, I think we it was selected be, because it goes back to that old film Network. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Where Peter Finch is the newscaster who uh -huh. becomes so incensed with the direction that it's I'm not gonna take it going, anymore. I'm, I'm mad as hell <laughs> and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and we thought, yeah, this does speak for us, you know. What kind of medicine did you practice? It was a family doc, mm -hmm. family medicine. Uh, probably delivered close to 2,000 babies over the course of my 44 years. Uh, in later years, um, I ended up s taking a special interest in uh, attention deficit disorder, ADHD, and uh, ended up with a very large practice, uh, really focused on that for the last five or six years. Wow, that must have been challenging. There's so much new learning around. It's a fascinating thing, you know. Th the reason I got interested in this is that my one of my wife's sons was diagnosed with ADHD, and it was embarrassing because my wife Donna was a school psychologist. You would have thought that she would have figured that out. Yeah. You know, I was a doc. I should have figured it out. But neither one of us recognized that and the symptoms he was having, and it was kind of a wake-up call for us, and it was a reason that made us start going to conferences and national meetings on ADHD and learning enough about it both to be helpful to Jay, but also to um, be more effective in my practice, really. And the result was that my partner started referring people to me, and then I started seeing kids and adults from the community, and when I first thought I'd retire at age 65, we used our computer system to count all the ADHD patients in my in our practice and my partners they had five or ten patients and I had 250 so I thought okay maybe I'll just keep doing just that for a while so for the last five years then that's all I did and when I finally did retire I had over 900 adults and kids with ADHD oh my god it's really amazing and you know ADHD is so poorly understood um, one of the things about it that I think is so amazing is that if you look back at the description, it was first described in 1902, and um, it was a British physician who didn't know exactly why these kids had trouble, but he thought there was something wrong with the brain. He called it minimal brain damage, mm -hmm. and that caught on. It was called minimal brain damage until probably the mid-50s when they had done enough testing that said, you know, there's no evidence of damage. They didn't have you know, head injuries or meningitis or something. So they changed it to minimal brain dysfunction, which okay. is that much better, <laughs> but not much. <laughs> yeah. And it evolved from there. Um, it's really, it's really been different. And now, of course, we understand that it is not a lack of attention and it's not a disorder. So it carries the name attention deficit disorder, even though it's not a lack of attention and it's not a disorder. And if you'd like, we could talk some about that. Percentage uh, inher uh, inherited factors or nurture, which the two contributing factors in uh, ADHD? Well, it's really it's a good question because it depends on how you call ADHD. And I like to think of ADHD rather as a difference in how the frontal lobe of our brain handles information. Mm -hmm. If you think about how we deal with the world around us, we first of all, we have to be able to notice it. Yes. So the first thing is to be able to see and hear and smell things and to be aware of the environment. And we all know people who are really good at noticing things, people who are sensitive to smells, people who notice immediately if it's cold in the room. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, kids, for example, who will say, I don't like this tag in my shirt, you know, it's rubbing in my neck. Mm -hmm. I never notice the tags in the back of my shirt, yeah. you know. But Our that senses. sensitivity, so that, so that how sensitive somebody is to things around them is important. Okay. The second thing is when we do notice something, then we have to put it in our brain, our frontal lobe, and we have to analyze it. We have to think about this. Is this as important? Do I need to know about it? Do I have to do anything about it? Those are important questions oh, to gosh. ask. Third thing we do is then we file that information. So we stick it in our memory. And we have all sorts of places in our brain that we can stick information about things we've noticed. The problem is, you also have to have a way to organize it. 
you have to have categories. Now, what we've learned is that people with ADHD tend to be very good at being aware of the environment and noticing things, but they tend to then spend proportionately less time using their frontal lobe activity to analyze it, to file it, to store it, to categorize it, to do the processing kind of stuff. And these things you're talking about now have been determined by testing and all the other... So what happens all. when we call it ADHD, what we're talking about is a set of behaviors, a set of ways that people act that can include procrastinating or being late for things and so forth, but they are better explained by looking at this issue of how we handle information. So for example, Somebody with ADHD may be spending 90% of their time noticing things around them, being aware of things, and only 10% actually processing. If you go into a classroom, say you sit in the back of a third grade class, and little Johnny up there in the second row has ADHD. And so Johnny's sitting here trying to do a, a math paper, and he's writing down, and somebody drops a book on the floor behind him, and he turns around and looks to see whose book it is. And oh, you dropped your pencil too, pick that up. And so then the question is not, why did Johnny turn around and look? The real question is, why didn't everybody else turn around and look? And that's because they were spending 90% of their frontal lobe doing their math sheets. And that 10% of being aware of stuff around them wasn't enough to pull them off track. Whereas for Johnny, who spends 90% of his frontal lobe noticing his environment and actually having a surplus of attention. He's only got 10% on this math problem and he immediately notices the book that gets dropped on the floor. I yeah. have some more questions, but I know we've got to need a, we need a few more hours to finish our show. Sure. <laughs> so interesting, I never it's knew that. Really, the one more thing I would add though, just quickly, is that when we talk about kids with ADHD having trouble being late or not getting stuff done and not allowing enough time, it's because for you and I, we have a timeline in our brain from the past to the present and into the future. Sure. And we use that timeline to put information, things that happen, things we need to do tomorrow and so on. Kids with ADHD, because they don't have this lot of time in the frontal lobe to organize things, they squeeze it down to just two times, now and not now. Uh -huh. Okay, and the result is that if you say, come on, we've got to go someplace this afternoon, it's not now. You have to do your homework. Well, that's not now. And so it gets put off. Why do they think that way or not think that it's way? It's because their frontal lobe is spending all this time addressing the environment and things around them. They notice all these things that are happening. But what they don't do is then put it inside, process it, categorize it, and deal with it. Is that genetic? Something going well, on there's the a strong lobes? genetic component. If you overall, the incidence of ADHD in kids in the grade school area runs between five and eight uh, percent. But if you look at the parents of a kid who has ADHD symptoms, fifty percent of the time, at least one parent has it. Okay. So it runs in families very strongly. Well, if we keep <clears throat> going in the direction we're going with computers, we'll have answers for. Mm -hmm. rest of this story. It's, it's fascinating. <laughs> and one of the reasons I love doing this so much is I got to meet all these interesting, smart people who couldn't figure out why it's so darn hard to do the stuff that everybody else seems to think is easy. I mean, stuff that's easy for me is very difficult for somebody with ADHD. Oh, I... On the other hand, I would be the first one to admit that I'm lousy at noticing things. You know, <clears throat> somebody comes home with a new haircut or a new shirt or I don't notice. I'm totally oblivious to things like that. But I'm really good at processing. <laughs> I can stick stuff in my brain and it stays there a long time. <laughs> I'm trying to make some sort of a connection with a personality, a, a, a way of thinking like Jonas Salk, one of those people mm -hmm. who worked in isolation for the most part and found a lot of satisfaction in that and people who have a sort of an average or a normal sense of registering what's going on, their attention is normal, and those who have the kinds of difficulties you're dealing mm -hmm. with in your practice. I think one of the problems that we ran into when we started thinking about ADD back from the days when they used to call it minimal brain damage mm -hmm. was it was the assumption that somehow these kids are not as smart. And intelligence or intellect is a different thing than attentiveness or processing. It's true there's some overlap, and it's 
it's difficult for kids with ADHD to perform well in the school setting because they're often so distractible or they can't find connections between things that make it sensible or make it reasonable, so they don't commit it to memory as easily. But if you look at these kids, you know, if, if I get lost up in the mountains someplace, I want to be with somebody who has ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> because then we'll find our way out. <laughs> interesting. I'm sure you've got some interesting stories which we can go into. Yeah. But we need to keep going to be sure, sure. we cover some other <clears throat> stuff that we plan be happy to, to cover. Uh, yeah. So... You're spending time with children and grandchildren mm -hmm. and photojournalism or anything like that anymore? No, I take, you know, the snapshots that anybody else would. With the advent of digital photography, I take way too many <laughs> pictures. I store them on Answer the hard that, drive of my computer. And, <laughs> but I've, I've, I finally sold all my darkroom equipment uh, some years ago. My enlarger and all the trays and developing tanks and all that stuff. I thought, well... I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. I would shoot plus X for years. I wouldn't go to color or anything like that. That's right. <laughs> I'm old enough. So a partner, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a husband, wife, one of those. Well, i got to include all of those categories. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, I've been seeing a, a woman uh, for the last year or so, uh, and you know we don't have any definite plans, but uh, it's been nice to have somebody to enjoy going out to eat with and somebody who appreciates food because I like cooking. So. It's fun. And one of my criteria for just being with anybody is they have to be smart, and it's really helpful if they're also funny. <laughs> <laughs> and she is both. Does she like you? I think so. Oh. Yeah, I think so. Will you tell her, look at that camera right there and tell her what you think of her. <laughs> <laughs> See, I got you. <laughs> tell her, go ahead, I dare you. She probably won't watch it since she doesn't watch television, but it's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we talked for a second about your political persuasion. Mm -hmm. You're uh, on the left, and so am I. And uh, memberships in political or social or civic organizations, that's worth mentioning right now. I'm an ACLU member mm -hmm. for all my life and a few other uh, organizations with similar interests. So anything come to mind for you? Well, I'm trying to think. I, mean, I still have memberships, per se. Uh, uh, I'm a membership member, of course, of the Physicians for Social Responsibility. Yes and also the Physicians for a National Health Program. Mm -hmm. uh, those, are, those have been big, big, um, very important groups for me because I think PSR has been working for years now to try to address the whole rise of militarism. And, yeah. uh, and that, you know, ultimately, if, if there is something that will doom the human race, it's the inability to seek peaceful solutions for problems. Um, the thing about PSR is that they began really as a protest, kind of like the uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament in, yeah. in England did, but, but they have moved now to dealing with things like environmental protection as well. Uh, PNHP, Physicians for National Health Program, though, has been advocating for universal health care for people in this country for over 20 years now, uh -huh. and uh, I think we'll continue to do so until we finally get it. And I'm pretty optimistic that we will ultimately have a single universal health care insurance plan for everybody in the country sometime, because we can't afford to continue as we're doing, spending 20 percent of our gross domestic product on health services, where 400 billion a year of that is going to overhead marketing uh, claims denial and so on, and still doesn't cover everybody. Uh -huh. Will we live long enough to see what you're talking about? I'm not sure. I'm not holding my breath, <laughs> but I'm not giving up either. I'm holding. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question for this part of the show. Uh, you have any heroes, people uh, from the past, or even alive today, that you particularly admire or admired or look up to? Any names? Hmm. Uh, many, many. I think Mulford Sibley, who was a professor of political science when I was in college, comes to mind. He was uh, a radical. Uh, he was also a pacifist and socialist and uh, excellent. I think my parents are people I 
learned a lot from and I continue to respect and, and be guided by their, their philosophy. My, my mother, for example, always told us as kids growing up that we should leave the world a better place than what we found it. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that could apply to anybody. Uh -huh. Try to leave it a better place. So you kind of look up to her a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah. She did. She was a good model, even if she didn't get elected to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a break and then come back and talk about the subject of the show. Mr. Director, can we take a break now and put up some stuff to occupy for a few minutes? <laughs> We're back. Thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who turned in late, uh, you missed the opening of the show. It's Conversations with Dr. Don. It's an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique one of the kind of individuals. And my guest, Gene Dr. Uphoff, is a certainly fascinating and interesting uh, guest. And I'm not blowing smoke at you right now. And uh, we'll continue on with the second half of the show. We'll be talking about why social change. An interesting title. Why that? What do you mean social change? What does that mean? Well, I'm going to toss that back to you because I'm not sure. When you asked me to comment on that, I thought, well, I'd like to find out more what you mean about social change. Uh -huh. uh, social change is inevitable if societies change. The question then is, can we guide it or shape it? And mm -hmm. for me, that's taken the form of being active uh, when I was in high school and college in the peace movement. Uh, peace movement? Then, peace movement, and then in the civil rights movement. So I've, I've been active on picket lines and protesting the war in Vietnam and so on. I spent uh, time in jail in Mississippi as a freedom writer back in the 60s. Okay. So those are things that uh, helped to push towards social change, but I think for me, at least, social change is going to happen whether it's good or bad. The, the real question is, what do we want our society to look like? And how can we make it move toward that direction? Well, the implication then when you say <coughs> social, social change is that you're thinking about positive or social change toward the better. Well, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. So if you are campaigning for Donald Trump, would you say that you're for positive social change? Well, I can't even imagine putting those ter things in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> ADHD. <laughs> I, I have a kind of a similar blockage, I think. <laughs> uh, maybe you want to say a few more words about your activities uh, in, in that period of time when you were the Freedom Writers. And well, when I was in college, in my first year, I was an 18-year-old and then subsequently 19-year-old student, first year. Um, I was active in a group that we had at the University of Minnesota called Students for Integration. Mm -hmm. And we had contact with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which had organized and uh, really supported the sit-ins the previous year down in Nashville. SNCC, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also we had had speakers from the Congress of Racial Qual Equality, CORE, Core. that mm -hmm. came and, and talked to us. So in the spring of 1961, when the first uh, push for the uh, integration of the bus terminals, transportation, so on in the South began, the Freedom Rides started in Washington, D.C., and by the time they got into the Deep South, you may recall the, the uh, buses were uh, firebombed and, and the uh, travelers, the, the Freedom Riders, were badly beaten in Alabama, and then um, they still were pushing on to Mississippi, which was thought to be sort of the heart of the Deep South and be the hardest place to go. And, and uh, Governor Ross Barnett, who was governor at the time, said, well, we have a way of solving this. You don't, we don't need federal troops in here. We will just 
make peace. And so they just immediately arrested everybody who came in. It was an integrated group who tried to integrate the, the uh, bus stations, the train stations, put them in jail. And there was a lot of publicity about that, and it, it was not good publicity, and it was embarrassing, I think, to the Kennedy administration. And um, I think if there are any viewers who would like to see it, uh, PBS has a very good um, program about the Freedom Rides that was done about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's available online. Mm -hmm. I just go to, to uh, public broadcasting. Um, but anyway, so our group in Minnesota got a call from uh, somebody in the, in the SNCC office in Nashville saying, um, do you have students there who'd be willing to come down and take part? So we had a, a meeting, and six of us ended up going down from Minneapolis. Uh, took the bus first down to, to Nashville, where we uh, w did a, a day and a half of uh, nonviolence training. Uh, that was fairly comfortable for me because I'd already been engaged with Quakers for a long time at that point. Sure. And uh, and then we went f by bus from there down to Jackson, Mississippi, and it, it was it, kind of weird because we'd stop at these little towns along the way. And there would always be um, a sheriff's group or some officers out there, and they'd be pointing, you know, at the bus and saying, there's one, you can tell them. You can always spot them, you know. And when we crossed the state line into Mississippi, I remember seeing this huge billboard that was uh, sort of white and purple and pink and so on, and it had a Confederate colonel on it, Confederate flag, a bunch of magnolia blossoms, and it said, Welcome to Mississippi. June is Hospitality Month. What I didn't know was their interpretation was that we'd get to spend six weeks in jail, free. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you didn't. And we did, yeah. We, oh, my gosh. We, we were sentenced to uh, actually uh, f four months in jail and a $200 fine, which is the maximum penalty for the breach of the peace misdemeanor charge that we were charged with. A trial that we had uh, lasted only four minutes. Oh, good it was justice! Straightforward, just boom, done. Um, and but we then filed an appeal of that at the 40th day, because under Mississippi law at that time, if you, if you stayed in jail longer than 40 days under a, any charge, you you lost your right to appeal. And the reason for appealing, of course, was so that this could go, if necessary, to the Supreme Court to actually get it taken care of. So it finally got resolved in the fall of that year after over 400 uh, people had been arrested in Jackson. Uh, we had tried to fill the jails in Jackson, figuring that the Hines County Jail there can only hold so many people, you know. Yeah. But uh, they worked out a good deal with the state penitentiary up at Parchman. Parchman. Ugh. So at Parchman Farm. So they then tr trucked us up to, to the state penitentiary at Parchman. Um, and at least uh, part of the maximum security and then the first offenders unit that they put Freedom Riders in <clears throat> in order to relieve some of the pressure on the Hines County Jail. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what happened was it was not, the desegregation was accomplished but not under civil rights. The Civil Rights Act, which was done by Johnson, really carried more weight. But the, what happened was um, after a lot of negotiation with Bobby Kennedy, who was Attorney General at the time, um, it was determined that segregation in interstate commerce was a violation of the Constitution's right to of the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. Uh -huh. And so the desegregation was ordered by putting pressure on the companies, the, the trailways and Greyhound bus companies and so on, saying you cannot operate in interstate commerce if you have segregated facilities. Not that it's equal rights. We're not talking about, uh, you know, civil rights you stuff. You got there, but through a side door. It was a side door. I mean, it did accomplish that, but I thought, hmm, a little sneaky. So it took the civil rights bill to actually. How did you feel about your activities during this period? And, and being in jail and the penitentiary and all, all that. Uh, it was it, normal. It's a normal no. thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> For me. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff you got from your parents and, and 
Yeah. Things all around you. Yeah, I, mean, I think there was no question that. Maybe you'd be the kind of human being that you are. We better get going here because time's going by and we've got to be to talk <clears> about <throat> our subject, right? Go for it. <laughs> if universal health care is so great, why don't we have it now? Why don't we have, uni why don't we have universal health care in America today? That's a, long, that's a long discussion, but I can try to shorten it down a little bit. Please. Um, there were some attempts going back to uh, Harry Truman to establish uh, national health insurance. And at that time, the American Medical Association was so opposed to the idea that they hired a Madison Avenue ad firm to launch a campaign. And they, you know, if you remember after World War II, everybody was worried about the communists. Yeah. So the uh, ad campaign that the AMA launched called this socialized medicine. And by labeling it socialized medicine, there was this huge fear and backlash, backlash against it. And everybody said, well, we don't want that. Why and would the AMA do that? Because they thought it threatened their incomes. Oh, their incomes. Yeah. And it's ironic because it was at the same time that Great Britain, coming out of World War II, having been bombed, you know, having been way more affected than the United States was, of course. that Britain said, we will establish a national health service, which was, in fact, socialized medicine, and, in fact, does way better than the United States does in terms of outcomes at lower cost. And although it is true that you'll hear people say that, well, you know, they grumble about care in Canada or about care in France and so on, but if you look at the most recent survey, which just came out in the March 2016 issue of Health Affairs, one that came out this month, they did an international comparison of satisfaction mm -hmm. of citizens with their health plans, the international. And Americans are the least satisfied with their health care system. Even though we spend more than any other industrialized country per person on health care. So uh, uh, the health care system in America then isn't working for the ordinary citizenry? It really isn't. I mean, if you look at Oregon, which has taken some advantage of the Affordable Care Act, we still have about 5% of Oregonians are not covered by insurance. And what that means in practical terms is that there will be about 195 people in Oregon who would die this year only because they don't have insurance, who have diseases or conditions that if they had insurance and could get treatment, that they would not die. Uh, sounds like our collective priorities as a society are out of whack. Well, you would think. I would think. <laughs> I do think, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's sad. And there is such a strong lobby. You know, there's about $400 billion a year that goes into the insurance companies for marketing, management, CEO salaries, claims underwriting, and so on money that is not given to Medicare, medical care. This is for financing of care yeah. and for overhead. And we could do much, much better. We could not only cover everybody, but we could take away that kind of insecurity about how do I get access to care. Everybody would be covered. There would not be, you know, huge $500,000, $2,000 deductibles that people would have to pay. There would not be big co-payments, 20% for a $1,000 MRI scan. So. It can be done better, and it can be done much less expensively. Why isn't it done? Because Except there's profit. profit again. Yeah, there's profit in it, and, and it's kind of too bad. But is it greed? Is it a I, characteristic I mean, of a that's kind of a harsher a term than I would use. I would think that it's just profit. You know, people look out for themselves, and uh, and it's hard to get the notion that if we all take care of our neighbor, then we will all have plenty. That's that's a philosophical stance that you would think would be common in the U.S., given the sort of historical Christianity that has been part of our culture. Yeah. But it kind of falls flat when people are actually pushed to make those kinds of calls. Isn't it a matter of education or learning or conditioning or something? What about the collective concern about humans for humans? Uh, that, that's, there's something else or some other things behind the scene or, or out of sight that are working <clears> that are having people behave so unlovingly. There probably are. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on that, but um, I've heard it said that there are, are sort of two big divisions as to whether you consider people to be basically good or basically sinister. Mm -hmm. 
And if you think of them as basically sinister, then you think they need controls placed upon them in order to keep them from acting in a way that's to everyone's disadvantage. Isn't it human nature that every human being has both of those tendencies? Well, then you can look at almost any behavior from that perspective. I, and I think, for me, <clears throat> I find that it's more consistent with my experience if I look for those things that bring us together rather than those things that divide us apart. Yeah. See my shine? Yeah. I, I think it's a great sign. <laughs> they continue. do need it the most. <laughs> yeah. Uh, should we let the government control our health care decisions? Um, the government, what does that mean? The government, that's a good question. Um, people worry about that. They think of socialized medicine as being this thing where the government decides what drugs you'll get. And, and in fact, what we're not talking about, government control of medicine, but rather how do you finance medical services. So there's only two countries in the world that really have socialized medicine, and that's Great Britain, mm -hmm. and we talked about, and Spain. And that means that the government not only funds the care, but it also provides the care. It hires the doctors, it owns the hospitals, it buys the drugs, and so forth. All the other countries that have worked out a way of covering everybody, Germany, France, Switzerland, Taiwan. so on, Taiwan. What they do is they have governmental or single payer, in most cases, funding of the health care, but the care is delivered by private doctors or hospitals or laboratories and so on. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it possible then for them to find a reasonable way of controlling the costs. In Canada, for example, drugs cost about 60% of what they cost here because the, na the health programs in Canada can, can negotiate prices. In this country, unfortunately, um, Part D Medicare actually had written into the bill that, that you may not negotiate the price of drugs. Whatever the drug company says is the price, that's the price you get. And if you recall the recent furor about uh, Mr. Shkreli raising the price of the, the drug for, for treating um, Relative, it's a generic drug for treating a relatively simple complication of HIV infections from $13 a pill to $750 a pill. It's just profiteering. It's just profiteering. And in spades. And I think that has no place in something like medicine, for me. I, I think that medicine is a privilege, and it's something that we should, or practicing medicine is a privilege. Uh, obtaining medical care is a right. And everybody should have a point should, to it. I uh, wonder mm -hmm. how well off financially uh, physicians and those kinds of people are in these other socialized medicine countries. Well, uh, again, there's only two socialized medicine countries, so I can't comment on those specifically. A socialized yeah. type, socialized medicine type. A types. single payer or, or universal health care. Yeah, universal. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So uh, I can tell you it's really interesting. In Canada, the primary care doctors, like pediatricians or family doctors or general internists, actually make more than their counterparts in the United States, about 10 to 20 percent more. The specialists, like the orthopedic surgeons, make less. So, for example, an orthopedic surgeon here may make 500 to $700,000 a year, depending on how big, busy they are and how active. In Canada, it's more like 450. But their pediatricians and their family docs actually do better. And in fact, there's actually been a net influx of doctors into Canada in the last eight years, whereas in years previously, there were doctors who would leave Canada hoping to make more money if they came to the States. So. <clears throat> uh, aren't private companies more efficient than the government? Again, the government, that leaves a question in my mind. What do you mean by the government? Mm -hmm. If you've got a government that's run by the uh, Republican Congress right now. That's mm -hmm. the government. Ah. But their behavior is They're such that. They're less than efficient. <laughs> <laughs> They're less than efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's this myth about um, government inefficiency or waste or fraud. And, and I say it's a myth not because it doesn't happen, because we all know that it does. There, sure. there are misadventures in how money is allocated and spent. Um, 
in every government in the world, some worse than others. The difference, however, is that it also happens in private industry, but we don't hear about it because while government mistakes are public record, and so we all hear about them, private industry mistakes are proprietary and they're hidden away and we don't ever get to see them. But if you talk to insiders, people in private industry who in fact know what's going on, they will tell you how much money. For example, it's not widely known, but pharmaceutical companies spend more on marketing and advertising than they do on research and development or on drug production. Transparency, a magic, magic yeah. word or idea. It would be nice. All right. We got time for maybe a couple more questions. Which one should I go to next? Tell, pick your favorite. I asked you about spending time in jail in Mississippi. You said a few words about that. Uh, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that uh, we, our morale was high. And um, even when they, you know, as punishment for the fact that we were all singing uh, freedom songs, you know, from the Civil Rights Movement, you they came and they first they, they took our toothbrushes and that didn't stop us. So then they came and took our mattresses and that meant we were sleeping on these basically like cookie sheets for cots. Um, and you lived through that. For, for three days and then actually the thing that got our mattresses back was the governor of Minnesota, uh, Elmer Anderson at the time, was being pressured by family and friends of the Minnesota Freedom Riders to send a uh, delegation down to Mississippi to check on the conditions under which we were being held. Um, as you can imagine, my parents were active in that group. <laughs> <coughs> and um, so they sent it down. And shortly before the governor's, uh, Governor uh, Anderson's uh, entourage arrived, we got all our stuff back. It was amazing. The juice in the background. They, uh, I think they didn't like the fact that that much uh, light was being shown on the state of Mississippi. It was yeah. uncomfortable to them. But that, of course, is what helps to bring about change is when people get to be embarrassed by their own behavior. Yeah. Shifting gears a bit. I'm thinking uh, the direction our country is heading in now uh, betrays what I see as irresponsibility and not caring and not loving. Loving is a good word. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, enough to care for fellow citizens and country and culture and the whole thing. And uh, it seems like we need to do what's required to have it go the other way. And what do you think needs to be done? There's, there's some things I think that groups can do and individuals can do. We all can do something. What do you think is more important? For me, I wear protest signs everywhere I go. Sure. And if anyone would engage a discussion with me, whether you're for me or against me, I enjoy that because it's out in the open. What, what do you need to do? Well, let me start by saying there's more than enough work to go around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and for the person who says, I want to campaign for um, better contraceptive rights for women, mm -hmm. I say go for it. For the person who wants to uh, work to get rid of the uh, Mississippi state flag, which, by the way, was just taken down from the capital in Salem, I heard. We won one again. Finally. Uh, I'd say go for it. That's great. If, if you want to work for health care reform and try to get single payer, I'd say that's great. I think if, if we were to try to find a single thing to achieve that would probably have more impact than anything else, would be to have a constitutional amendment passed that would overturn Citizens United. You know, <laughs> that would basically say corporations are not people. They're not and entitled to all the rights and privileges that the free speech and stuff that people have because they're not people. They are an artificial creation um, mm -hmm. of, of the law. And as such, they are not people and, and should not be entitled to the protections that the Constitution affords to we the people. <clears throat> okay. So, so that's what Citizens United has got to go. That would that would be I'd say if there's one fundamental thing that would give us more uh, positive change than anything else, I think that's it. Now we've got about 
30 seconds or so for you to talk to the viewers mm -hmm. about anything comes to your mind right now, anything that you want to say to them, because it's <laughs> your, it's your <laughs> soapbox. Which, which camera are you going to be wow. looking at here? I don't have a soapbox. I tend not to do that. I guess that's why I'm not in politics. I but, love soapboxes. But so the thing that ahead. has been most persuasive to me over the years is that we need to treat each other pretty gently and to, to assume that when we see something bad happening, that oftentimes it's a result of ignorance or not understanding things rather than, than pure malice. And, and incompetence and ignorance tend to go a long way to explaining kinds of the things that we struggle with in this world. And I think we need to do what's required to do something about ignorance. Mm -hmm. There's a whole discussion that goes uh, on that subject <coughs> that we can spend a couple yeah. of hours with. So it looks like we better sign off and have a couple of public service announcements before the director yells at me. To watch my shows on the web, go to Don Bay on YouTube and click on a particular show. And the next uh, PSA is about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Good. I've been a member of the ACLU for 400 years. Oh, no, it feels like <laughs> it. <laughs> it's a wonderful organization. Go there and learn. And to have my shows broadcast on other stations, ask your local public access station to go to www.pegmedia.org, and they will tell you how to get my shows shipped to their studios and broadcast in that local area. Okay, the end corporate personhood. Go to move to amend.org. Great. Okay, and they got one more to go. Okay, I'm supposed to thank you. Oh, thank you for watching. And I hope you had as good a time watching us talk as I enjoyed uh, Jane. And because it was of how a pleasure you are to be personally here. and what you're about in your life. And thank you so much for coming. It's a on. pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. You betcha. <laughs> Kind, friendly, and charitable. Yeah, I gotta remind you about being kind, friendly, and charitable. KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Dr. Don's KFC, kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable. To you too. That's a great idea. <laughs> you too. And you too, nurse. And you too, Roger. And anybody else who looks like they could use some stroking, them too. So. Uh,